discovered the reflected cross polarized light technique um, and started applying it to meteorites, this was one of the first ones I applied it to. Mm -hmm. So as we're rotating the polarizer here. There we are. Yep, that's it. <laughs> um, this one I barely unpacked, um, which just showed up. Um, and sorry, it's, in, it's still in the box, but oh. NWA 13400, which is part of the new um, CL group, CL 3.9. Um, is the sand, and there is the 709. Oh, I, the what, a, what a collection. That I finally awesome. got myself a perfect circular pearl. Uh, this is uh, this is back from uh, uh, a uh, Nobel Prize um, extract from uh, 2011. Uh, so you know we're we're talking some serious level science here. Uh, Mountains. It is just a little one, but. I got it um, on eBay from AZ Meteorites and they had an auction and I got a really good price. So I got that. For this subject, 108 photographs were taken in total. Next step is to focus stack them using the Zerin stacker. The whole stacking process can take up to half an hour. Next, I need to combine individual uh, images into a high-res panorama. Oh, I wanted it to. Does anyone know the name of this one? New Dive Station. Egg personal slice. Mm. This is uh, 103 grams. What's goodness? An, an, another awesome thing about this, it's a witness fall. Mm. No, appreciate that. Um, so this obviously has a nice mirror polish. Um, any, any guesses as to what this is? I have Color's a guess. Not, Color's not sure. This one has a really nice dark inclusion down here that you mm -hmm. can't see that way. But if we rotate 90 degrees, you can see that it's actually a, um, that one's actually a troll light bit and that one's a dark inclusion there but we'll oh. go back <laughs> thanks a lot guys have a great weekend or weekend yeah. whatever it is take care, take care all good night right. hey everyone it is wednesday and time for today's weekly topher spin meteorites uh knowledge bolide we're going to cut it short today we're only going to do about a, an hour hangout um but we're going to get right into it with some good information um i have a video that, I'm, that we're gonna play later on because we've had some questions about uh, photography and there's a whole bunch of levels of photography skill sets and equipment um, in order to, to capture meteorites in your, up to your skill level and budget level. So I do really well, I believe, with my brand new, uh, Samsung S21 Ultra with uh, has a super macro feature with laser focus guiding. It actually shoots a laser out and you can see what's in focus and what's not in focus. And it should speed up and also give me some really good pictures. Well, another way to accomplish amazing detail is by photo stacking. Um, so I have a video that we're going to go right into right now. I'm going to try not to butcher his name. He's a, uh, one of our fans from the Ukraine, um, from, I'm sorry, from Croatia. And I'm not cheating because I only have one screen right now. His name is Domjan Sivovchek, ah, something like that. So let's see how close I am. Hold on one second. We'll so Damian Svilkovic, hopefully we're getting that correct, is uh, uh, takes some amazing photographs. He's in Croatia. He has a really heavy accent, but I told him it's way better than my Croatian. So um, he's going to hopefully comment on the YouTube video and put a link to his uh, some of his photography. But it's super, super detailed, 
and he's going to show us how he accomplishes that. So here we go. Hi, I'm Domin from Croatia. I would like to show you what it takes for me to take one nice photo. I got an excellent deal from Douglas on this rough but beautiful dark lunar patchy. At over 2 grams, this is my largest lunar. I have carefully hand polished it in two different planes for low loss of about 10%. As you can see, the polish is not perfect, but with cross-polarized light magic, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. I'm simply in love with this lighting technique and I'm grateful for Earth Pet for introducing it. Isn't it magical? Here you can see my modular macro setup taking a series of photographs. I can do both continuous and flash lighting, both polarized. For this magnification, I'm using a single 50mm lens on extension tubes. My fully automatic macro rail is capable of 10 micron increments. There are a lot of 3D printed parts. The rail is controlled remotely from a phone. One image sequence that can take more than 10 minutes, so it's best to just leave it be. For this subject, 108 photographs were taken in total. Next step is to focus stack them using the Zerine stacker. The whole stacking process can take up to half an hour. Next I need to combine individual uh, images into a high res panorama. I actually do most of my final editing on my phone in Snapseed. Here is the final result. It's a truly beautiful fine-grained breccia with a ton of differently colored clusters. Each image takes a lot of work, but I believe the results are worth it. I hope you've enjoyed this video and thanks for watching. Wow, bravo. Yeah. Uh, that that nice. lunar uh, just made it into the um, uh, Met Bowl. Uh, Domian wanted me to point out that that is NWA 13916. NWA 13916. Right. And look at all these photos of it that he has up here. A hundred and, uh, did he say 108 or 180? 108. 108, 108 photos. What is truly amazing. This is what I was talking about my camera has. Uh, if, you, if you looked at, at, one, at one point, it showed a little bit of laser, uh, laser assisted focusing on his, on his setup, but his setup is absolutely amazing and totally see the laser focusing. But this what he's entire... doing is actually moving the stage in little steps and taking multiple photographs. And then in the post-processing that, you know, the problem with doing this sort of microscopic, um, uh, photography is that the depth of focus is very very small and so by taking a whole bunch of pictures 10 microns apart and then digitally recombining those you essentially artificially extend the depth of focus of the camera same thing happens with the microscope yeah, that's, that's one of the problems that I was having with my old phone. I need to see if I'm having with my new phone is it, I, I go for utter precise focus, but I have to pick what I want in focus because the rear of the rock won't be as sharp focus if the front is. Yeah, that's pretty much normal. That's it's just the way it, that the camera lens works. That's the, actually the way our eyes work. You know, we, th we think we see things all in focus, but our eyes actually keep moving constantly. So it's like if you're focused on one little thing and, you know, your eyes shifting forward and back, forward and back to get everything in focus. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons uh, if you look at um, masterworks, master artworks, they see you, they tend to focus, have one thing in focus and everything else kind of fades out because that's more how we normally see. And that's how we see. And then it's like, 
you know, when you see everything in sharp, it there's something not as realistic about it. Yeah, our brain does a lot of that post-processing. And the same thing happens when you use a truly binocular microscope. Uh, your brain combines those images left and right and uh, gives the impression of a 3D uh, image. Uh, but this depth of focus stuff is just physics. The, uh, there aren't any, any uh, ways around it aside from uh, artificial techniques like focus stacking. Yeah, I, I just thought that was, because I mean, I've heard of photo stacking before and I kind of, <clears throat> you know, knew what it was, but to see a rig like that <clears throat> and when you go to his, his webpage, I and mean, he's on Facebook as well, but if you go to his, his webpage, you open up, uh, you click on a photo and you open it up. And it's just a massive, massive photo, and you can move all around. It's it's pretty intense. Um, <clears throat> let's go to uh, Bruce one second. All right, hey Bruce, what do you have for us, buddy? So I got a few new and interesting items. Um, this one I barely unpacked, um, which just showed up. Um, and sorry, it's, in, it's still in the box, but <sighs> NWA thirteen four hundred which is part of the new um, CL group, to CL 3.9. Um, and I think you can see, I hate doing this. I gotta get a better camera set up, but you can see that there's definitely some metal. It's definitely um, grabs onto the magnet. So this is from uh, Mirko um, Grau. Yep, Mirko Grau. Yeah. And um, so on the back, he's got a really nice COA. Um, and yeah, it like fits all nice, neat in the box. I haven't even taken it out because he, he taped it up pretty well. So he can't open the box. Easily. <laughs> um, and I'm like, well, if it's in there pretty nice, if I take it out, am I going to get it back in? <laughs> Sweet. Um, yeah. So this is, you know, kind of interesting. So um, that's, that's the first CL ever. Yeah, it's what well, there are several. There are several in the group, but this is the one that kind of pushed to think into defining the group. Maybe one of the other guys knows better. Yeah, uh, so there were um, a number of other uh, carbonaceous chondrites that were uh, just called ungrouped. Uh, and when th this one, I believe the the nomcom rule is the fifth one. And so when you have five that all align very well, then you can call it a group. And so uh, this should be the fifth CL. And uh, will they go back and edit the, the other five or the other four? Uh, yes, I believe they do. It, it, the, that uh, situation with the Met Bowl being kind of frozen is definitely uh, under change. Uh, they're, they're, they've gone back and corrected a number of things in the last six or eight months. Um, so I, I, I think at least for this two-year term of the members on the NOMCOM, um, we will see more uh, active work of correcting things and updating as, as new science comes about. That's pretty good. That's always good to hear. Um, I've, I've been kind of, uh, <clears throat> we're going to go to James Shelton next. I still have, I, I have two more things. Oh, awesome. Sorry. Hold on. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to shortchange Bruce in New York. Go for it, buddy. What's next? Yeah, I don't never okay. want to cut you off. No, oh, appreciate that. Um, so this obviously has a nice mirror polish. Um, and any guesses as to what this is? I have Color's a guess. Not, color's not showing up so well here. I, I have a guess of what it is. All right, go for it. Can I see the other side just to make sure that I... It, 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 it's a little more reddish than it's show, showing up here. Yeah, it looks to me like uh, a... Hy a hydrothermally altered lunar named Tissant or something like that, 001? Tissarlantin 001. That's it exactly. Nice. Tissarlantin. That's a big slice. 
Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. So that came from uh, Craig Zleiman. And um, I was going to say, what's the weight? Yeah, 11, 11 grams. A little over 11 grams, just a hair over. Very nice. Um, yeah, and it's like when I got it, he's like, sorry, it's going to be a delay because I have to repolish it. I'm not, I'm not happy with it. I was like, <laughs> okay. I'm like, you yeah, know, that's fine with me. So, the good thing about a, a, a slice that size, and I would love to like have photo stacking of that one, uh, is because it's a unique lunar because it was it was so, so. it was altered. Oh, geez, really Ooh. thin. Yeah. <laughs> Knife blade. <laughs> it, yeah. it was altered by water, and they believe that it was altered in situ, meaning on the moon by water. So by having a sample that large, you can actually see the material a lot better. Mm. Yeah. So also from Craig is something that's new and I don't believe is classified yet because there's no name for it. Um, but this is the one that's got dual lithologies. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> That kind of is see. a huge Sorry. bleb by your finger. Yeah. Do we have yeah, well, any any idea what the classification may be? I didn't ask him. Um, all it said was that it's a dual lithology. Hmm. So I think they're, you know, working that out. Um, cool. Uh, the They're camera got, is. Go ahead. No, it, it, yeah, the, this doesn't really show it up so well. Like there, the metal veins that are in there. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, like okay, I'm gonna I'll go off that and say the camera's not the best, but it reminds me of Dar El Kahar. It's mm -hmm. uh, a it's a beautiful, beautiful meteorite and looks just like that. So when we're done here, um, you click like on the video and then uh, Google Dar Al Kahal and take a look at it. It looks very similar to that, I think. Yeah, I, it's hard to tell because uh, uh, you can see that like there's like a totally different part here than here. Mm -hmm. Sure is. Mm -hmm. That's a huge slice. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's uh, almost 31 grams. Very nice. Wow. And you said he's having it classified, so make sure you stay on him to get a new uh, COA. <laughs> yeah. And that's all I have today. Maybe maybe some more next week. Very nice. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. You didn't buy anything from me, so how could you have anything being delivered? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I scored something on eBay that I like was amazed at, and when I show it to you guys, you, you guys are gonna be like, "What?" Um, I, yeah, I, it's it, sometimes you get a really good deal from really good people on eBay. I was like surprised that there was an auction, um, and I got it for I think half of what I expected to pay, and hopefully wow. that'll be here next week yeah and you guys will probably kill yourselves over it but all right from matt yeah from matt you scored one of them good deals i know you did <laughs> yeah just the other day oz exactly yeah yeah and i, I and i i'm, I'm I, i'd never done business directly with matt before and i messaged him and i'm like you know i didn't expect it to go for what it did um, and he's like, yeah, well, as long as it's going to somebody that's going to enjoy it, I'm happy. Hey, you know, what's funny is I won a, an 85 gram chili of Binks on one of his um, auctions. And I got it for like 200 and something dollars. Wow. And I felt so bad about it that I did the same thing. And this is when I was first starting to know him. And he said, hey, you win some, you lose some. And Matt's a great guy. Great he's, guy. He's an extremely good guy and a uh, great guy to hunt with. And um, he has some amazing connections and sells some incredible meteorites. 
That's and we're, we're talking about uh, Matt, Matt Stream, Matthew Stream of uh, Streaming Media Rates. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So awesome. I, I look forward to seeing that bruiser. <laughs> um, let's see if James Shelton is ready for us to go to him. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me okay? You bet. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. I used to be a stamp collector. Uh, I tried to give it up and I became a stamp accumulator instead. Uh, <laughs> I, when I started collecting meteorites, I saw that there were some meteorite stamps. Uh, there's Hoba and Dakota Lane, Cape York. And uh, I saw these on eBay about a month ago. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to take the specimens I have and set them next to the stamps? So these stamps, actually, I just opened the package about an hour ago. And these are all meteorite stamps. Uh, here we have Canyon Diablo, and uh, uh, here's a Campo de Cilio. And uh, they also, these are called souvenir sheets. And they have some extra illustrations around them. A lot of the uh, post offices in different countries will uh, create these just for stamp collectors. And you can also just buy the stamps individually like this. This is nice. the way that came in the mail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to acquire uh, specimens for every meteorite stamp and create just a, like a mini display with the, uh, with the stamp next to the meteorite. Nice sure. idea. Hit me up, James. I've got a bunch of stamps. Maybe we could do some trading. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. That's all I had. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. So I, uh, it, it's weird how uh, you go from being a uh, collector to a hoarder. There's a fine line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also have some, uh, some stamps that um let me see here let me see here uh i, I also have some stamps um my my brother eric uh passed away many years ago of a brain tumor but he was a philatelist stamp collector i want to throw that out there um and so uh as an homage to him i started collecting a few stamps and then i realized you know what i i need to limit and hone in my collection so i actually have some uh space related space exploration related uh like russian uh stamps full sheets um and uh so if anyone's interested in those let me know because they're really not doing any good sitting at the bottom of my drawer right now so um let's see here i'm gonna pause for one second awesome we got a volunteer chris monk oh hey if you don't tell the good news I will. <laughs> um, what good news about my company? Yes. So on April 24th, um, I officially incorporated Rock. Well, I got an LLC for Rocks on the Ground. And I've spent the last couple of weeks trying to get my logo and my um, name and COAs printed and business cards and stickers and, and all this kind of stuff. So I haven't been actively trying to sell any of the stuff that I've been getting ready um, because I'm just focused on trying to get the other um, down. But yeah, so that's new and exciting. I created a page. So if anybody wants to follow it, it's called Rocks on the Ground LLC. And yeah. Um, and I'm super I, excited for you, buddy. I'm, I, and I, you have the passion yeah. and, and the drive and the work ethic to make it a success. I know that. Absolutely. So all, all credit given where it's due. Um, me and Topher were brainstorming and he came up with the name Rocks on the Ground. And so it grew on me over a couple of days and that's what I went with. Yeah. And, cool. uh, and, uh, yeah, so it's it's one of those things like it's one of the catchphrases, one of the words, one of the phrases that we use all the time as meteorite collectors when we see something like, oh my God, I, that was a nice bolide. I hope there's rocks on the ground. Well, trust yeah. me, with, with Chris Monk meteorites, you're going to have rocks on the ground. So exciting. <laughs> so for those of you who know me and um, are friends with me on Facebook and stuff, I live in Arizona. And so I, over the years, have started collecting the Arizona Falls. Um, these are two. You can't 
live in Arizona and collect meteorites with having a Franconia. <laughs> and you also can't live in Arizona and not have a Canyon Diablo. Absolutely. But one I didn't have that I just got. And since we like playing the guessing game, it's much smaller. Let me see if I can make my camera focus. Can anybody guess what that one is? Wow, I'm coming up with a big negative. It looks, it's definitely a, I'm going to call it an L chondra, even though there's a huge hunk of metal there. Could it be Wickenburg? Mm -hmm. It, it is not Wickenburg. Oh. Well, one more guess, and then I will reveal the name. Um, I, I'm just throwing this out there because it's a famous witnessed Arizona, and there's, there's only four witnessed Arizonas, Whetstone. That is not it either. This ah, is my next guess. <laughs> this is Tank Mountain. Oh, man. Mm. Huh. Tank Mountains. It is just a little one, but... I got it um, on eBay from AZ Meteorites, and they had an auction, and I got a really good price. So I got that. Nice. That is awesome. And that's a nice, to, if you're going to have a one grand piece, you might as well have a one grand piece with a huge hunk of metal in it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and um, just that's all I had to show, but um, I also had something else that if you – want to. I don't know how many people um, follow NASA and some of the stuff going on other than Mars, but um, for those of you that don't know, there was a mission with a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx, and OSIRIS-REx was sent out to um, meet up with a asteroid a uh, near-Earth asteroid that was called Bennu. And on Monday, OSIRIS-REx started its return mission to Earth. One of the things that I found fascinating about this was I didn't, I always had this vision in my head of um, a big rock, just one big rock, solid, it's coming towards the earth, it comes through the atmosphere, there's a bullite event, it explodes and shatters rocks all over the, the ground. Um, but one thing I never, for whatever reason, considered was that there are conglomerates of loosely attached, basically a a floating pile of rocks that have been attracted through static and, and the gravity of the asteroid itself. Um, so Osiris Rex actually took a sample. It did a touch and go. It came in and, and touched the surface, collected a sample, stowed it, and they're bringing it back to Earth. So in my head, there's meteorites like NWA 869, where it's a uh, L3 to 6, um, numerous different um, types of stones. And that just clicked for me on Monday when I was watching this video that some of the rocks are white, some of the rocks are dark. They've all been their own individual out in space. And then they came together into this floating pile and sometimes those floating piles enter Earth's atmosphere. So you could have a strewn field with multiple different types of rocks that all came from the same event. Anyway, I just found that really interesting and um, just kind of wanted to talk about that for a minute. Yeah, that's a really cool phenomena. The, uh, the term that I've heard some of the planetary scientists use is rubble pile. And um, the uh, uh, Almohatacita meteorite uh, that landed in, help me out, the Sudan? I think that's right. Um, 
was really interesting because it was the first one that we'd actually tracked in space and and it was way closer than we thought it was and it re-entered in a short period of time and um the uh it, the sudan is a war-torn country that barely operates as a country uh, but eventually one of the university professors got a bunch of students out to the desert and they walked across the desert with the students 20 or 30 feet apart well actually they would have done it in metric so it would have been six to ten meters apart and uh picked up all of these rocks uh that all obviously fell together at the same time with varying classifications and so that was the first one where we had some tangible evidence of the rubble pile idea. And that's certainly what we found at Bennu. And um, yeah, the, the OSIRIS-REx uh, spacecraft just left Bennu uh, for its, its voyage back to Earth. And it's to take a little over two years for it to get back. So in 2023, we'll have some freshly collected return from an asteroid stuff and the from the spectrometry that they've done of that asteroid it really appears that it is a carbonaceous chondrite sort of material and the uh photos that we've seen so far which are not super detailed uh or super fine-grained but certainly looks like a c1 or or something very similar a fine-grained uh carbonaceous so that that's really an exciting project. We actually yeah, the, did one of the hangouts uh, the day of or the day after the tag event. <laughs> so if, if you search the YouTube, my YouTube channel, you'll find us uh, uh, talking about it live and actually going into really, really finite detail about the event itself. And I, if I recall correctly, I think we even laid down a little friendly wager of how much weight they would get back in the return sample. So <laughs> stay tuned in two years to see who won that. <laughs> yeah, it's probably going to be on the higher end because remember they had that problem where uh, it jammed, basically jammed the, uh, the mechanism up and they ended up just closing the whole thing instead of doing what they, what they were originally, originally they were going to spin the craft to get the moment of inertia and estimate the weight of what they collected but because there was so much stuff and if they went and started spinning they were already losing rocks that were just floating out because it wasn't it didn't seal the way it was supposed to seal um so they just said well let's just take it all and we'll you know deal with it in a couple of years yeah and if i also if i also remember they they were also suspecting um that they saw some um lighter colored stones and they were suspecting that they were from vesta that are also on there Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the touchdown spot was more um, not was probably not from that. But who knows? You know, you know the, uh, there. The, the photos are really hard to interpret because there's really nothing uh, to give a sense of scale. And um, the the rocks that they were talking about is boulders uh, that they had to avoid with the spacecraft as they came down and did the touch and go. Uh, were like meters apart or, or meters across uh, when you know they looked like small rocks from <laughs> from the picture. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. One of the names, one of the named rocks that they use for reference as far as location um, is longer than a hundred yards. Yeah. <laughs> Another really interesting thing I, I learned about it is how much water is on. The asteroid. Yeah, of course. Apparently, that's it's covered in water. Yeah, that's one of the big questions. And of course, the uh, if it does turn out to be C one sort of material, uh, one is the most uh, altered by contact with liquid water. Hmm. Three point zero zero is perfect, and as you go from three to four to five and up to seven, there's that's more heat and pressure. But as you go from three down towards one, it is more and more aqueous alteration uh, being right. chemically right. altered right. by liquid water. Yeah. Uh, I, I've had the uh, unfortunate opportunity to spend a lot of time on the couch the last few days. So I took advantage of it to try to make, uh, try to educate myself a little bit. And, uh, and a question that I've had in my head 
uh, at several times was perhaps answered by Dr. Lawrence Garvey uh, of ASU, the Center for Meteorite Studies. Um, and so if I can pontificate for one second, if you look at Meteor Crater, you expect there to be a huge iron meteorite in the bottom of it, but there's not. They drilled and mined and it, there's nothing there. So the theory is, well, it evaporated. It, it, when, it, when the iron meteorite hit, it evaporated and left these little spheroids. Well, in my head, I've always questioned, well, then why the heck do I have Canyon Diablo in my collection? Why do I see, you know, massive kilo, like 30 kilo uh, hunks of Canyon Diablo everywhere? I mean, if you can, I could literally tonight buy a 20 kilo hunk of this stuff if I wanted to, and, but it vaporized. So there was always a disconnect. And in this uh, uh, lecture that Dr. Garvey was giving, he uh, explained that, and it goes along with a little bit of the rock pile that we were talking about earlier, where uh, the new theory or the new idea is that Canyon Diablo was a massive, you know, 150 by 150 meter hunk of iron with other in tow. It, it was surrounded by other smaller ones. So when the big one hit, the other ones were falling alongside. <laughs> and one of the very, very interesting things about Canyon Diablo that was also answered during this lecture was Canyon Diablo is one of the rare irons that actually contains micro diamonds and nano diamonds, well, micro diamonds. Um, sizable ones, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking small, but sizable. Um, and the theory of that is, as the big impactor hit the ground and caused this massive explosive shock wave, the other pieces penetrated through that shock wave. And that massive crater forming shock wave went up and affected other pieces going through and highly shocked them to the point where the carbon was transposed into nano diamonds within 10 nanoseconds or milliseconds or something like that. I so I, I thought that was- there, there's, some, there, there's some other interesting uh, evidence as well to support that idea of a, um, uh, of a, a group of bodies traveling together. The Gibeon string field in Namibia uh, is huge. It's, uh, I've heard numbers like 35 miles long. I've even heard numbers like 50 miles long. And um, so that one, you know, fell a very, very long time ago. If it did create any craters, they're not evident anymore. Um, but uh, that fits that idea of a bunch of bodies traveling together rather than one body disrupting in our atmosphere and creating a 50 mile long string field. By comparison for things that come in, you know, as one piece and then um, break up, we typically get string fields on the order of a mile and a half, two miles wide and maybe three or four miles long. Uh, if things come in at a very, very shallow angle like Chelyabinsk, uh, the, the, uh, string field can be longer and that one disrupted multiple times. But remember, Topher, the, the, the uh, footage that you found of the um, new carbonaceous chondrate that fell in England, uh, as Which the main one was coming in, yes, as the main one was coming in, as it started lighting up, you know, as the atmosphere got denser, there was another piece parallel to it. And so there was yeah. a track parallel to it. So, so I think that idea has been pretty thoroughly um, worked through and we are reasonably confident that, that, you know, these things travel in groups. The other part of that makes sense is that um, these things all had to have some sort of a collision to get in an earth crossing orbit. And yeah. that collision makes multiple pieces. And if a bunch of, of them are, tra you know, started out with, with a certain direction, um, you know, some are going to scatter, but some can be grouped together. Yeah. 
and if I remember correctly, you you were using the uh, the example of uh, Amahada Siddha. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, there are like twelve different lithographies, twelve different classifications within mm -hmm. that meteorite, and right. there's crazy crazy people like um, Mike Kelly who want to collect <laughs> one of each and every little of the, of the lithographies. Uh, mm -hmm. But one one thing that's really good about uh, Mike is he's he's uh, he digs into stuff. He's very educated and he's willing to learn. Um, we got into a discussion based on some feedback I was getting on some uh, some wild claims from a non scientist about quasi crystals being in their oh. meteorites <laughs> and. Um, quasi crystals to me sounds like you know harmonic vibrations and and you know that that kind of fooey gooey stuff, but there is a real thing called a quasi crystal, and they were recently discovered. Uh, they were hypothesized for a while, but recently discovered and to be existing in in a rare meteorite sample. Now I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but I've asked. Uh, uh, Mike Kelly to kind of fill us in a little bit uh, and give us uh, Meteorite 101 uh, regarding quasi-crystals. So pause for one second. Yeah. All right, so we have our resident geologist uh, checking in. Hey, what's with them quasi-crystals, man? <laughs> yeah, so the, the title was kind of a joke because uh, as Topher was saying, uh, this conversation started because, uh, you know, this was like stuff... Uh, that you saw referenced on uh, eBay scams and stuff like that, you know, contains quasi crystals and turns the lights off when you drop it. And, uh, you know, all that <laughs> other good stuff. Um, so, so I wanted to put this together just because, uh, you know, they are a real thing. Uh, and so there's, there's hard science behind them and it's, it's probably worth knowing. And they're really interesting um, because they really kind of fundamentally changed the way we thought about the structure of, of crystals. Um, so if you want to pop to the next slide, Topher. Um, so every one of these slides I got uh, somewhere on the slide, I should have the uh, the, the uh, references down here. So if you look at the lower right, uh, this is uh, this is back from uh, uh, a uh, Nobel Prize um, extract from uh, 2011. Uh, so you know we're we're talking some serious level science here uh, that's uh, gone through, and uh, like I said they got you know, put up for the Nobel Prize for this because it, it changed the way we understand uh, structural mineralogy. Um, so kind of what I got on the slide here is uh, to understand quasi crystals, you got to understand how we used to think about crystals before that. Um, and so a crystal is a solid material. Uh, it's got a lattice structure. Uh, all the atoms and molecules and ions inside of it are organized in a way that they repeat uh, and create a pattern. Um, and that pattern is called uh, periodicity, right? Um, so one of the things that's unique, unique about those 3D structures is for the longest time, they said there's certain patterns you can have. You know, you could form a, 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 a um, two symmetry pattern, a three symmetry pattern, a four symmetry pattern, uh, and a six symmetry pattern. But everything else was basically, uh, wasn't believed to set itself up like that in nature. So you couldn't have a, a five symmetry pattern. So if you look at the um, images over here on the right-hand side of the slide here, you, you see a... Uh, uh, a four symmetry pattern on the, the left and on the far right, you see a six symmetry pattern. And in the middle, you see a five symmetry pattern. And you can see the spacing doesn't really work out on that five symmetry pattern, right? The, uh, the little red dots on the, uh, the top and bottom, uh, what you represent molecules, are, are too close to each other and don't space out in a way that the pattern would repeat itself over and over and over again. Um, so, so again, that kind of gives you an idea of, of up until these quasi-crystals were found, uh, what set the rules for uh, the way mineral structures worked. Looking at uh, slide number three, Topher. So um, quasi-crystals is really all about why that happens, right? Um, so the atoms and molecules and ions inside the crystals all kind of find their spacing and set up in those repetitive patterns because it, uh, it's an energy efficient structure. Um, so those forbidden symmetries, what basically makes them forbidden, uh, is that they don't fill a space very nicely. Again, you, you don't get that repetition, uh, and, and they don't evenly distribute all those atoms. 
Um, so they, they don't really form in a way that, uh, that creates an energy um, smart environment. Um, and that's kind of why they call them quasi crystals. Cause what ends up happening is there is an order to them, right? You can see with that Pentagon that was in the middle in the last slide, um, there's, there's is a pattern, but you just can't force it to repeat properly. Um, so what they kind of, when they say quasi crystal, they really shortened it up. What they're really saying is they're uh, known as quasi periodical. So they'll repeat a pattern, but they won't repeat a pattern perfectly spaced. Oh. They'll have voids. And again, you know, that, that shouldn't happen in nature. Um, but of course they do. <laughs> so looking at, uh, looking at slide number four. So what happened was, uh, you know, at first we, uh, we synthetically made these in the lab. Um, so I, again, this happened in 1984 was the first time that they, uh, they in a lab, they were able to create a quasi crystal. Uh, and the gentleman who did it, um, Blevin actually sat on it for two years. He was so nervous about releasing it uh, just because it was so, it shouldn't happen, right? You know, everything up to that point uh, in mineralogy said that this, this structure shouldn't repeat itself. You, you don't get this to happen. Uh, but they took uh, aluminum, magnesium, and they, they made these uh, quasi crystals uh, in the lab. And that's the way it sat for a really, really long time. Um, so what was neat about it was when he finally released it, everyone in kind of the, the mineralogy arena, uh, didn't want to just change the definition to allow these new, uh, couple of shapes that were found, uh, because they figured more would come along and lo and behold, they would be wrong again, you know, if they didn't fundamentally change the entire definition of what a crystal is. You know, so this this came out and this changed the way that we define crystals. Um, so I kind of got a quote on here, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, and it said, uh, uh, at the uh, to point out a recent review, uh, we have not known when the next class of non-periodic ex uh, existing crystal structures will be discovered or if there will be such a discovery at all. Rather than making the mistake again of being overly restrictive, science now treats exclusive statements uh, on long range order, which they're talking about period, uh, with caution. So basically they took that whole periodicity thing and they yanked it out of uh, crystal definitions because of uh, finding these. So looking at slide five, um, this is, uh, you know, Topher likes to talk about the wow signal. Uh, so <laughs> this, was, this was the wow signal uh, of quasi crystals. <laughs> Uh, right. So again, like I said, uh, you know, it was published in 1984, but in uh, April 8th, 1982, um, Dan Shetman, who was the original um, person who found these, you know, uh, was jotting down notes on what he saw in the structure on a SEM, uh, scanning electron microscope. Uh, and if you look at uh, number 1225, he came up with a tenfold structure, which again, we said you weren't <laughs> supposed to get over six. And, hmm. and he got tenfold symmetry in there. Uh, so that was the wow moment uh, okay. when this all got realized that it was possible. And this is actually um, X-ray diffraction, Mike, that we're looking at. Uh, yes, and that was uh, that was part of the issue with it is to to get these structures to come up. I guess, uh, and I'm not really great on this part of it. Uh, it it's very hard to get them to generate a solid image uh, and, and lock in the configuration of where the atoms are. So you know, you can see these kind of patterns that he's getting. You know, but this is the cherry picked best of the best, uh, you know, so, you know, the, to get a pattern to, to show up, uh, especially when it's, you know, supposed to be uh, something that doesn't show up in an in, in order you should see uh, causes you to, to doubt it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to you... get that tattooed on me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. If you want to go to slide seven, Dofer. I think I'm there. Yep. Okay. So they generated these in the lab and they generated a couple different versions of them. And then, you know, naturally they wanted to say, okay, well, can nature do this? You know, we've, we've synthesized these things. And that's the way a lot of um, crystals and, and minerals actually occur is someone will come up with the science and the theory behind it and they can produce it in the lab. And then, you know, you go out into nature and you try to see if you can find it. Um, 
So that that happened for a long, it took a long time to figure that out. Um, and finally, they managed to do it. Um, so well, what you see on this uh, slide is a little piece of a mineral, mineral called uh, catrachite, um, which is found in Russia. And it's that little tiny micro mountain you see on the right hand side with a, with a coin there for reference. Um, mm -hmm. And you're talking, uh, this, this thing uh, is a subgram, way subgram sample, you know, under, under a tenth of a gram. Uh, and this was a mineral that they found in, uh, it was sitting in a museum collection out in uh, Italy, if I remember correctly. Um, and what they had done was they realized that these things formed with aluminum in them all the time. So they were looking at aluminum-based minerals. Um, and the actual mineral structure of the quasi-crystal inside of this mineral sample is called uh, icosahedrite. Um, and that was the first one I was found. And that was that mineral with the tenfold symmetry. So uh, looking at slide number seven, that's a little picture of it. And we, you know, we, we've talked about uh, stitcherite before, um, which you, uh, uh, is, a, is a high pressure form of quartz. We talked about that last time when we were talking about uh, Libyan desert glass. Right. Uh, so this was actually found inside of a crystal of stitcherite. Um, and, and again, like I mentioned, it was it was out of a museum collection uh, from Florence. Uh, and that's where they discovered the first natural quasi crystal. So this little mineral sitting over there. Uh, and if you know a little bit about minerals, stitchivite, uh, as we talked about in the Lebrian desert glass part of it, it's not something that forms on Earth, really, because it's a super high pressure form of quartz. Mm -hmm. right? right. So it's what forms from. Uh, silicon dioxide under extremely high pressures, pressures you don't see generated on the earth near the surface where this thing was found. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was no kind of transport mechanism that would um, bring it to where it was uh, in terrestrial processes so that you come to the logical conclusion. Where did it come from? It didn't come from the ground. It had to yeah. come from the sky. Wow. <laughs> right? yeah. so, so looking, go ahead. Well, where is this picture? I'm sorry if I missed it. Where is this picture from? Like, what what is this picture of? They, they found uh, so, the quasi crystal in, in in the matrix of it. Yeah, so that's the, you know the the surrounding part of it is the uh, is the stitchivite material, and what you're okay. actually looking at is the uh, the quasi crystal within the piece of stitchivite in there. Gotcha. Okay. So, looking at uh, slide number eight. Uh, so again. Uh, the, the crack uh, um, mineral specimen contains that uh, tenfold symmetry piece. Uh, and then here you see, this is just the overall kind of piece of what they were looking at, you know, under, uh, you know, plain polarizing light uh, microscopy. So what is this thing? Uh, if you pop on to slide number nine, there it is, right out of the memo. So like I said, there is not much of this guy. 0.1 grams listed. Wow! <laughs> and and they classed it as CV3. Yes, so it's it's a CV3. Uh, what they did was uh, they've it's actually since they found two more uh, quasi crystals in there. Uh, and again, um, the the minerals that they're looking at are a kind of a combination of um, off the top of my head, it's aluminum, magnesium. Uh, or I might be mixing it up. I'll, I'll clarify it and, and put it in the chat later. It's either magnesium or manganese um, and copper. So there's different quantities of, aluminum, of the copper, three. Iron. Aluminum, copper, yeah. Alu aluminum, copper, iron. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, so there's different amounts of it in there and, and, and of those blends and they're causing different structures. And what's weird about aluminum is usually aluminum oxidizes all the time. Um, so the fact that uh, this had free aluminum in it, or just, you know, uh, elemental aluminum non-oxidized uh, is, is what kind of allowed these, these quasi crystals to form. Uh, and again, these were highly um, impacted. Uh, so you're, you're getting these formations from an extreme amount of, of pressure um, and heat uh, as a side effect uh, that basically allows these crystal quasi crystals to form and stabilize. So, you know, a lot of people thought that they would decay and break down and, um, 
you know, release that extra energy in them and, and, and seek to form a, a, a pattern structure, uh, you know, that, that better fills the void space, but they don't, you know, they stay stable. Um, so again, this is, this slide shows you, these were the other two that they found in there. Um, uh, and yeah, again, you can see that the, the one, the third one that they found, yeah, aluminum, copper and, and iron as, as the blend. Okay. Uh, and you can see the kind of the odd crystal structure again, it's a, it's a five fold symmetry on, on this one. Wow. Um, I wonder if the aluminum comes from the CAIs that are common in CD3. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, that'd be interesting to, to kind of dig into. Um, and, uh, and one of these, these gentlemen is at uh, Princeton University. So, I mean, uh, when, uh, when COVID's all over, I definitely, I'm trying to get over there to go see him and talk to him and, and, and learn cool. more about it, you know. Um, cool. Excellent. They are, they're pretty cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the kind of the, the last slide, uh, again, I, I touched on this already, you know, it's, it's the fact that there's unoxidized aluminum in this particular CV3. Um, and, uh, you know, they were trying to figure out naturally how some of these form. And, you know, they figured it would be pretty complex to try to reproduce it. I believe they ended up doing it with a, with a high-speed pellet gun, you know, just, just impacting the material to see what happens under uh, induced pressures. Uh, and see if they could, for, uh, you know, induce this and form these materials. Uh, and, and they did. So, you know, they're basically theorizing that these quasi-crystals are the direct impact, uh, direct result of, of asteroidal impacts. Would that um, be a super collider that they would have fired that through? I, I, I think they were just using standard uh, air pellet. So they're, yeah, not okay. even getting, they're not even getting up to the crazy... Uh, you know, vacuum required uh, super colliders that you're using just like a single molecule and speeding it up uh, yeah. and running it in. They're, they're operating at the, at the macro level. Yeah, at, at one of the NASA research facilities, and I don't remember if it's Moffett Field, one of the research facilities, um, they have a, uh, a nitrogen driven gun that's driven with compressed gas that can launch an aluminum uh, pellet or sphere uh, at uh, orbital sort of velocities. They've used it for looking at cratering uh, events, firing this pellet into sand. Um, but that's really cool that they can uh, cause these, you know, gigapascal range sort of pressures to, to form these quasi-crystals. That's cool. Absolutely. Yeah, so that, that's everything I had. But as you know, as a guy who collects along the lines of uh, trying to get specimens with different minerals in there, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm keeping my eyes out that they find another one. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't think I'm getting any of that point one grams. <laughs> no. uh, Mike, I, re I really appreciate uh, you sharing that information with us and educating us. That, uh, that was fantastic. Great job, buddy. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Great. Nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I have uh, I have one thing I'd like to show off. Uh, oh, it's <laughs> it, it, made, it made its debut before I wanted it to. <laughs> Does anyone know the name of this one? New Dive Station. Exactly. This is a silicated iron, and. Um, Wow, I absolutely, this one uh, was in my personal collection and is now available. If anyone would like to purchase it, it's 49 grams and I'm asking 10 bucks a gram. So it's $500 because yeah, the, I just replaced it. The, the pictures that you did of that <laughs> one on, uh, on Facebook look really good. They yeah, sure do. I, I was working with the pro settings on my new phone my new camera with the phone attached and uh yeah i got really nice warm uh silicate colors great definition in the differences of colors of the metals it's just a beautiful beautiful meteorite and here's what i'm replacing it with this is wow my new personal slice mm. this is uh 103 grams what's goodness an, an, another awesome thing about this so witness fall. Mm -hmm. So what you're looking at here is the non-etched side. And then once you etch it, you get the 
Wow. The distinct, yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, I'm really my, pop. My Very nice. Work or not? No, it's not letting me zoom in today. They're all up for zooming like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm I'm really happy and pleased to the, add this to my collection. When I was in in Tucson this year, it was one of the stones that I was uh, was was actually hunting for uh, for my personal collection. I really wanted a nice slice of Edi Station, so glad I finally got that. Uh, last call for anyone to show anything off. I've got a few things, Topher. Okay, hold on one second. Well, why don't you just go ahead and... Uh... Okay. So, <clears throat> last time we were talking about tectites. And, um, yeah, we got that hoarding comment in there, too. Uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics of a hoarder is things are not in good order. And so I... Uh, guilty of that so in digging around and digging through some boxes i found my uh bits and pieces of button flange tectite so this is actually half of a button flange tectite and you can see uh if you look at this in the microscope it's really cool the uh this is broken and then soil etched in this plane and you can actually see that streaky structure uh lipping up and around and rolling over the lip the other thing that you can see here, too, are the little tips uh, there that are the uh, uh, raised part of the shock ring. So here's... Oh, that's nice. Cool. That's sweet. And then on this side, yeah, it's not really showing up super well. But my lighting is just not... And this, this camera is not cooperating. But at any rate, you can see some of the structure there. So, um, you know, if you can't afford a whole button flange, um, you, can, you can probably afford bits and pieces. So this is another broken button flange. This is the backside. And you can see some of the rim here. Yes. And this one shows those. Yeah, it's not really showing up very well. But you can see some of the of the ring structure there. And then when one of those button flange tectites uh, completely disrupts, uh, it becomes one of these, which is called mm. a cover. So that's the front side. And then like a uh, like an oriented meteorite, that's the back side. Mm. And then I've got a whole bunch of other little bits and pieces of button flanges here that mm. you can see some sure. of the, this, that started out being a really small one. Mm -hmm. And then we talked, uh, but didn't show an example of a Meng Nong tectite. So this is one of the Indochinite tectites from oh. Vietnam. And this one is extremely frothy. You know, it, it looks to the world like a, like an impact glass, very much like that Zamchan glass. Mm -hmm. There's holes through it, and it's, it's very layered. So that's one of the tectites that uh, didn't get completely uh, incorporated into very vitreous, you know, very very glass-like um, material. And then we also talked about uh, Libyan desert glass. And uh, can anybody find the interesting connection on this one from the uh, prehistoric tool? Yeah, it's the Please. Utahs collection, which is our own Jason Utahs. Yeah. And this one is from the 90s. Wow. So, wow. Here, here's a piece. And it, it has a little hole that's full of dirt and a sand grain or two in it. Uh, and there you can see the conchoidal fracture. Uh -huh. And then, so this, this one had part of the cortex of the piece of Libya desert glass. So that's the, that's the wind sculpted side and that's the fractured side. This one is just the fractured part. Oh, you oh. can see the conchoidal fractures on both sides and then wow. there's a bunch of very small chipping around the edges if I can 
light it up properly. Well, you can see it better without the light. Uh, there's the uh, little chipping around the edges to sharpen the edges. So somebody um, a very, very long time ago, six or eight or 10,000 years ago, used that as a knife. And then I have one other thing to show That's off. That's pretty cool because they were also using it as jewelry and they're using it as tools as well. Yes. Yes. So this is one of my very favorite uh, meteorites. This one was, was uh, classified some time ago by Marcin Samala uh, as an LL 3.2. And about the time I discovered the reflected cross-polarized light technique um, and started applying it to meteorites, this was one of the first ones I applied it to. Mm -hmm. So as we're rotating the polarizer here. There we are. Yep, that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the money shot. Yeah, it, it just pops. So a hoarder can never have just one of something. <laughs> And so I, I know I have more slices of this, but I can only find three of them at the moment. But uh, this one has a really nice dark inclusion down here that you mm -hmm. can't see that way. But if we rotate 90 degrees, you can see that it's actually a, uh, that one's actually a troll light bit. And that one's a dark inclusion there. But we'll oh. go back to mm. there. And then uh, these were these were display case samples of these, uh, but I decided that I had to get a couple of ugly ones to make uh, uh, thin sections out of. So they are someplace in a box. Well, I'm really only too happy to take it off your hands, Pat. If you, you know, You're so ugly. Disappointed with it, so. <laughs> And that's uh, that's about what I had. <laughs> Thank you, Topher. Hey, no problem. I appreciate you showing those things off. Um, any other people wanting to show stuff off? Any other comments or subjects? Mike has his hand up. Hey, Topher, I got a couple real quick if you want to wrap it up. Yeah, start going and uh, I'll highlight you. Okay. Um, right, so yeah. sticking with Tektites, because um, we did that last week, and uh, Pat just showed off the Monk Nong. We missed a whole branch of them. Micro Tektites. Yes. <laughs> so nobody has shown off any of those. So these are Micro Tektites, uh, and this this batch is from KP Sediment out in Haiti. Um, so you can imagine, you know, Chicxulub to Haiti is uh, is no short distance. Um uh -oh. So yeah, they, these were painstakingly picked out, and these are just the microtectites, and and under the scope, they are nice little bits of greenish brown glass. Um, wow. they, they're very much what they are supposed to be. Um, and then I have one more one more sample, and this is from uh, stateside. This is uh, Hell's Creek. Um, so there's there's the raw material in there uh, as collected, uh, and then you go ahead and you start digging through it and that's some of the finer material in there that has uh both burnt material and uh and microtectites mixed in there uh, as a small sample oh so you, you you actually separated these out out of the uh, uh no these were separated out by the finder so uh ah, okay. so this was different Sweet. material gotten from the finder um okay. refined just the the bulk stuff and then i also got a little piece of uh uh burnt up material from that same uh kp layer Cool. Uh, just kind of make a little Hell's Creek set. Um, nice. And then sticking with impactites, this is all different stuff from Waybar. Uh, so crater forming iron on there. Um, and as you can see from my numbers, I've been been at it for a while trying to get a complete set of everything you can get from Waybar. From two well, to seven hundred. Mm -hmm. So that was the iron. That's a little bit of uh, well-fused ground uh, impactite. That is uh, some loosely consolidated uh, sandy material. Mm -hmm. That's the shale that comes off the outside of the pieces they find. And that's, that's mostly what you get if you get waybar iron nowadays. You're actually getting uh, waybar iron shale. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting, getting the unoxidized iron is kind of hard. Um, that's a splash form uh, aerial bit of material. Down oh, at the wow. bottom is the sand, and there is the 709. Oh, the what, a, what a collection. Let I finally that. got myself a perfect circular pearl. Those, wow. are, nice. those are hard to find, and when you do find them, they're either ridiculously cheap or ridiculously expensive. Yeah. <laughs> that is uh, a very hard to assemble collection right there. Yeah. Yes, uh, fantastic. <laughs> Finally cool. glad that that set is done. <laughs> yeah, wow. That the, is pretty the, slick. Uh, shocked sandstone material down the lower right is looks surprisingly like the shocked Coconino uh, sandstone from uh, uh, Meteor Crater in Arizona. Yes, mm -hmm. it, it really does. And I'd be interested to know if there's any polymorphs in there, because I know there are polymorphs in the one from uh, Meteor Crater. I believe there are. Um, I still have the bag full of pieces I picked up out of the parking lot. Uh, so drop me a note. <laughs> yeah. Get to the nice. Thank, thank you, Mike. Was that, was that all of them? I didn't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Off. That was it. Awesome. Um, I'll lower your hand. Um, one second. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you bearing with me today and getting it through. Uh, even though it was a shorter uh, hangout, we got some good information and we saw some cool stuff. Uh, Mike Kelly, thank you for your uh, quasi education. <laughs> and uh, and we definitely want to thank Damian from uh, Croatia for his uh, video submission. Uh, it was some really good photography, and uh, he's going to be submitting more uh, videos. Uh, and he just received a box from me. So, hmm. <laughs> so I told him if you photograph my stuff, I'll make sure I'll make sure to squeeze you in somehow. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great weekend or weekend, yeah. whatever it is. Take care. Take care, all. Good night. Good night.